welcome to the Alex Salmon Show where we continue our series on Wither Catalonia. In the aftermath of the Spanish elections, is the battle for the future going to move from on the streets to online? Alex reports from Barcelona where he's been interviewing government ministers and international observers on the future of the rebellious province. But first, to your tweets and emails on recent shows. In last week's show, our panel of political pundits roamed far and wide, assessing the prospects of all the parties competing for seats in the UK general election. Speaking about our pundit show, Maureen says, another excellent show, Alex, always informative and relevant. Dougie says, the only sensible thing that's worth viewing. Well, thank you, Dougie. Kath says, the pundits don't always get it right, but they're willing to admit it. Yes, they are. I always enjoy listening to Ruth Wishart. She is so refreshing. Well done, Alex and Tasmina, for a great wee programme. Arthur says, aye, a grown-up civilised discussion among thoughtful political observers. Fabulous show. And Highlander says, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The pundit element I thought very good. Now, when an ardent Tory says the Tory lies need to stop, then you know Boris is in trouble. Then speaking about our first programme in the series on Catalonia, Caroline says, the dignity and courage of Laura and Chell, and most incredibly, the lack of bitterness were so moving. I hope international pressure, so far milk toast, can be brought to bear on Spain and that all nine are released so the families are reunited. Thank you, Caroline. Now, we've asked the new Spanish government for a response to our first programme on Catalonia, featuring the spouses of two of the independence campaigners sentenced to long terms of imprisonment, but are yet to receive a response. When they reply, we will cover their comment or their interview. However, Reuters reported last month that Spain's socialist leader Pedro Sánchez was stepping up efforts to control separatist groups and parties' activities on the internet, saying that his government would not allow Catalonia to set up a virtual independent republic online. The characteristic of demonstrations in Catalonia and indeed elsewhere has been the ability to mobilise large numbers of people into street demonstrations at very short notice using online communications. Online, the Catalan independence movement may have reigned supreme. However, this may be about to change, with the Catalonian Minister of Digital Policies and Public Administration, Jorge Puigneiro, claiming that the Madrid government are intent on assuming extrajudicial powers to clamp down on social media traffic. Over to Alex, who is speaking with him in Barcelona. Minister Jordi Pinero, welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Thank you for inviting me. Now, Minister, your responsibilities uh, in, in government uh, encompass the digital economy as well as the, the, the Catalan civil service. Tell me a bit about how you're positioning Catalonia as a, a digital hub in, the, in, the, in the Europe and the world. Well, Catalonia uh, has been over the past uh, the, the fabric of, uh, of, of Spain. It's the most uh, industrialised uh, area in, in the Spanish state. Uh, we were the only part of Spain that we did the Industrial Revolution, like uh, you know, in England and other parts of the world. And now uh, we want to be the digital hub of uh, not Spain, but of uh, at least the south of, East, uh, south of uh, Europe. And what uh, successes can you, you point to? Is there a, a killer statistic you can give us which will, will say how Catalonia is uh, successful in becoming this, this digital hub? Well, uh, it would be, I think, um, not very objective if, if I said it myself, but I will use other figures. Yeah. According to Financial Times, uh, uh, right now we, we are in the south of Europe, the most attracting region to invest in this new digital economy. Uh, we host in Barcelona, the capital of Catalonia, the most important technological event right now in the world, which is the Mobile World Congress. Uh, we also host the Smart City World Congress, which is how we use these technologies in order to have better cities, eh? uh, more efficient cities, uh, cities which uh, use technology to uh, provide better services to its citizens. Having these uh, two events, uh, uh, creating a brand, it's also another uh, policy uh, which makes us strong uh, in order to, um, to, to be able to attract companies in order to attract talent to Catalonia. But all of this drive uh, to become a digital hub, to become the, the, the focus of uh, activity in, the, in Southern Europe, takes place against the background of huge constitutional 
controversy, of tumult uh, here in, uh, in Catalonia. Doesn't that political uncertainty, it doesn't it inhibit your uh, economic plans? What are the impacts that you can see in the economy of the, this great uh, uh, political controversy? Well, I think we see uncertainty around the world. Eh? We've seen Brexit in the UK, we've seen uh, in Paris uh, all these demonstrations of the yellow shirts in the streets. Uh, I think that uh, that's not the problem. The problem is whether we are civilized or not a civilized society. And I think that uh, in Catalonia we've shown the world that uh, uh, we have our own, uh, obviously, controversies with the Spanish authorities, uh, but we are trying to solve these controversies democratically, in a civic way, in a pacific way. The people from the business world uh, understand that. We've seen how uh, we are positioned as the second uh, most digital uh, city, that is Barcelona, in Europe after London, according to Nesta, which is a European index. Tourism has been growing, uh, which is also something which uh, people, uh, when uh, they see uh, riots uh, all over the world, uh, they take uh, uh, you know, uh, decisions according as well on what they see on the TV. But recently there have been indications that the Spanish state are planning a clampdown on the social media, uh, virtually intercepting uh, everybody's messages. How concerned are you as digital minister that uh, such a, a draconian clampdown might be introduced? Well, I have to say I'm very concerned, but not, not for the Catalan citizens, but for the whole Spanish citizens. Uh, this is a practice which is more similar to Turkey, or to yeah. China? Yeah, or to China, than to what it should be a European standard. I haven't seen this in any European country. So we are really concerned that uh, the Spanish uh, authorities, uh, for trying to stop a democratic movement, which is just yes, using the social media as a tool as everyone else. But will the European regulations, uh, the competition regulations, the freedom of expression uh, aspects, perhaps in uh, Strasbourg Court, would they? Uh, override a Spanish attempt, or can the Spanish state cite security reasons as a, an exception to normal standards? Actually, uh, what the Spanish state is, wants to do is that they, uh, they say that uh, according to uh, not only national security reasons, but according to um, public order reasons, or to even for uh, economic interest, they will be able to shut down uh, the internet in any part of Spain. Uh, without a judicial order, just uh, because the government will say so. And is this technically possible? With your background, you're <laughs> better placed than most politicians to, to know. Technically, could you, you black out Catalonia from the, the digital uh, expression? Well, uh, we will see whether they do it. Uh, we've seen what, how are they doing it in, in Turkey uh, and in other parts of the world. Uh, we think that this is uh, something which should not be accepted by uh, European laws. Actually, we want to appeal uh, against this decree that the Spanish government uh, has announced regarding two very, uh, very important issues. One is uh, the freedom of internet, so that you can the access, freedom of access to internet, which is something you cannot just uh, cut down uh, as you want. It should, it should be regulated and uh, well regulated, and uh, should be respectful uh, with uh, the other principle, which is the freedom of speech. How do you see the Catalan crisis coming to a, a resolution? I mean, most observers can't believe that uh, it can continue indefinitely in a process of stalemate with a majority opinion for independence in Catalonia and a majority opinion in the rest of Spain against Catalan ambitions. How, how can you see a a resolution of the crisis, and can there be any resolution without the freedom of the the imprisoned uh, uh, independent supporters, whose uh, whose symbol you carry in your lapel? Yeah, my previous minister is in jail eh, just for promoting and making it possible so, so that the people of Catalonia could vote in a referendum. Well, we 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 think that uh, this is a process which has been for almost ten years right now. Uh, so. The demand of the Catalan people for, at the beginning, for more autonomy. It was not an independence process at the beginning. It was just the demand of a fiscal authority for definitely more, more, have more autonomy inside Spain was uh, actually um, pulled uh, down by the Spanish government. Uh, uh, we 
with uh, its constitutional court saying no to a status, a new state of Catalonia, which had been voted by the Catalan parliament. It had been voted by the Spanish uh, uh, parliament where the Spanish sovereignty resides of the whole Spaniards. And it was approved by referendum in Catalonia. That law, that new Catalan constitution, which was not an independent constitution, was ruled out by the Spanish constitutional court. That after that, people started voting pro-independence uh, parties. And now we have a majority in the pa Catalan parliament for independence. And we've had a majority for some years. And I think that will continue to show and it will continue to grow if the Spanish government continues on, on its way of not wanting to sit down and negotiate, not wanting to sit down and having a dialogue with the Catalan authorities. But you've won elections, uh, the coalition of parties, not just your own, yeah. but the coalition of parties who support independence. Uh, you win the Spanish elections in Catalonia. You've had a referendum. Uh, we've won all the elections uh, for many years. And you still are no nearer independence. So what can be the resolution to, uh, to the Catalan controversy? We believe that the only solution, this, is, this, has, this has to be a political solution based on dialogue. And that means that um, uh, institutionally, Spain is having for the last four or five years a, a, a lot of instability, economically and institutionally. They, they don't have, they've had four elections, they, they have approved only one budget in the last uh, four years. If they don't think that without solving the Catalan problem, they, don't, they won't have stability, uh, is that not understanding how important is uh, Catalonia uh, in the way um, of, for, for Spain to understanding uh, what the future of Spain has to be. Negotiating a solution. Maybe you can negotiate a solution for the next 10, 15 years. The only way to solve that is through dialogue, through negotiation. Well, Jordi, I can't bring everybody to the negotiation table, but what I can do is present you with uh, the Alex Salmon Quake for, for appearing on the show. And now, uh, you know, the, the drill from Scotland, it's uh, whiskey, only Scottish whiskey, <laughs> only Scotch, in the Quake, and then you, you pass it around everybody who attends the negotiations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Minister, thank you so thank much. You. Join us after the break, where Alex speaks with international commentator Liz Castro. Welcome back. The Catalan independence struggle has had huge currency in the social media worldwide. One of the reasons for the informed reaction has been the rapid translations into English and the informed comment of a remarkable American Liz Castro, who in her time in Catalonia has embraced the independence movement. Alex caught up with Liz in Barcelona. Now Liz Castro, you're a, an American in Barcelona. Tell me what, what uh brought somebody across the Atlantic a number of years ago to, to experience Catalan life. You know, the first day that I walked into this office where I was looking for a job, they found out that I spoke a tiny bit of Catalan, not very well, and um, they never spoke to me in Spanish again. Um, and it was, it was a wonder. They were so appreciative, so welcoming, and that speaking Catalan opened many doors for me. People wanted to take me um, to their homes for parties, to talk to me, to, they took me on vacation. They, they treated me as one more person in the family and I felt like the, my effort at speaking Catalan in the 1980s as an American was one of the, the pieces that made that happen. It was, that was a special thing. There weren't very many people who did that. And that was surprising because in the United States, you know, when you go to the United States, you have to speak English. Everybody does. And nobody thinks, oh, that's so wonderful you speak English. You just take it for granted. And here that's not the case. So as a, let's give you a fairly unique insight, uh, or certainly a rare insight, because you're uh, an American coming to Catalonia, but you're learning to speak the language. So it gives you a very good vantage point to, to, to assess that, that uh, eternal question is Catalonia a nation and, and what are the characteristics of the nation of Catalonia? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question and it's something that I noticed right from the beginning. I had traveled a fair bit in Spain. I had been to Madrid, I had been to Galicia, I had been to Andalusia um, and other places and there were a number of things that were different here. There's a feeling about it. There's a feeling of identity is the interconnectedness of, of people. 
you must have made a big impact on, on you, Liz, because you went back to America, pursued this highly successful uh, uh, career in web design and books about computers and online and the mm. democratization of the web. Mm. Uh, and then returned uh, to Catalonia in uh, 2011. So it was quite interesting, you as a, an outsider, albeit someone with huge knowledge of Catalonia, are there many people of different nationalities? I think you got the most votes of any candidate when you stood for the National Assembly. Is that, is that normal? Are there, are there lots of these people from other countries part of this, uh, this grassroots national movement? Somebody like me, who's an American, I've lived practically all my life in the United States, except for 10 or 15 years here, can also be Catalan and be considered for you know, the, the national board of the Catalan National Assembly, which is a, it's a lobby, it's not a political, it's not, a, it's not an elected office it's a volunteer group. Um, it is elected, because you've got... It was elected, on. that's true, but, it's, but I mean, it's not, you know, it's not an elected as in... Of government. Of government, yes, yes not a, an, a governmental body. And in terms of your own contribution to the, the National Assembly, this grassroots movement, mm. I mean, clearly the, your expertise in, the, in online matters, has that been a big influence in the, this burgeoning growth of the of the, the Catalan independence movement? The, the fact that the, so much more is possible in terms of contact with uh, with the with the democratization that comes with the online process has oh, that been central to absolutely, this? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it wouldn't we we wouldn't be here if it weren't for Twitter and Facebook and particularly WhatsApp lately and Telegram and Signal and whatever else you know is coming now. But you've also been a very articulate voice uh, for the Catalan independence movement in the, in the media worldwide. Uh, again, you have an advantage because, uh, you know, as, a, as a, a native English speaker, you're able to translate from the Catalan and, and give a, a view. Is the fact that you're an American, is that also helpful in, in terms of being able, despite your immersion in the, in the Catalan movement, mm. it still gives a certain degree of distance? Maybe. You know, I think it's there's good things about it and bad things about it. I mean, the fact is, I'm not Catalan. I'm not from here. And so sometimes it feels like it's not my place. On the other hand, I speak Catalan very well and Spanish, and I've lived here for a very long time, and so I've seen all the things, not all of them, but, but many of the things that make up this process, and it's complicated. You know, I've met practically all of the people who, not practically, I've met all of the people who are in jail right now. I know them personally. Um, and I have other American friends who say, you know, I've never met the president of the United States, but I've met all of the current, all of the Catalan presidents. How is that? Is it that Catalan society is more accessible? Is it because we're American somehow, you know, that makes us, you know, special? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, what I do know is that, that this community aspect of Catalonia, the importance that people put on talking and on debating and on deciding what they want to do and on listening to people, that's very special. And that, that's something that that should be celebrated and, and taken advantage of. The prisoners, uh, a personal tragedy for the nine people involved, of course. Yeah. But history would teach us uh, a great rallying call for the, for the Catalan national movement. Uh, uh, there are very seldom in history where uh, substantial sentences of politicians works to the benefit of those who are imposing the sentences. Uh, the general rule is that what was the benefit of those who are incarcerated. What's your impression for? Where do you think this is going to take the Catalan national movement? Well, there's, there's many things about it. Like you say, it's a tragedy. When I think about those people in jail, they're just regular people. You know, they're politicians who had a mandate to have a referendum. And the fact that they've been jailed for sedition violent overthrow of the government is it's just ridiculous and it really proves well of course the violence wasn't established uh, in, in the in the charges which no. I, I suppose is quite interesting because if you look across most democracies then then sedition is something that has to now be days be associated with violence very very few countries apart from Spain have sedition as an offense in itself 
and well. certainly not America, where obviously freedom of speech would be preeminent pre pre over, over all things. Absolutely. They say that one of the reasons that they originally accused them of rebellion is so that they could keep them in jail, because with just charging them with sedition, they couldn't. And so the rebellion charges, which uh, involve, according to the Spanish penal code, you know, violence, real violence with weapons, and it's stipulated in the statutes, could be used to keep them in jail until they were convicted. The statute describes sedition as any kind of resistance using force or pressure against the government. That kind of definition, we're all seditious, all of us. I certainly am because I resist with pressure things that my government does all of the time. There are plenty of things that I disagree with. Um, so if people are in jail for nine years for that, that means that there's no democracy in Spain because Spain will simply uh, apply that definition of sedition to anybody that it doesn't like. And that's a, sh that's a shame, and that's a, that's a travesty. But that is not the point. I mean, you have this contrast between popular opinion, democratic opinion, political opinion in general, outraged by the apparent draconian nature of these sentences and the questioning as to whether merely speaking out uh, against a, a state or a government can possibly be considered a, a crime in a democracy. Well, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, the, the governments of Europe, the institutions of the European Union, have been pretty cool towards Catalonia. Yeah, and it kind of gives you an idea about if they're just cool about democracy. Because they've certainly been up in arms about Hong Kong, about the democratic supporters there. Uh, they complain a lot about democracy in Venezuela, in any other place besides Catalonia. Why? Because Spain has a lot of influence within the European Union, and they don't want to be on Spain's bad side. But if Catalonian democracy is inconvenient, uh, what does that tell you about the prospects for, for success? I mean, can uh, popular support translate into success against institutional opposition? Well, there's a thing about people in general, I think, all around the world, and it's that they're not really willing to live without freedom. We're sort of waiting to see what was going to happen with this trial. You know, were the judges really going to be honest and impartial? And when they handed down 10-year sentences for demonstrating and for holding a referendum, we realized that there was no justice in the Spanish court for Catalonia. But after these sentences, it becomes so much more basic. We want independence because we want to live in a democracy. We want to be able to have freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of political, uh, you know, manifestation. And that is not allowed today. Jordi Cuxart and Jordi Sanchez, who are civil leaders, are, have been in jail for the last two years and will be in jail for seven years or more because they participated in a nonviolent demonstration. I was there. I saw it. They did nothing except tell people to go home. And they are now jailed for sedition. And would you say that that thirst for the right of for speech, of uh, freedom of assembly, or freedom to elect your, your own government, or become independent, is that going to propel Catalonia to independence? Or will it take a, a tea tax or, or, or something harsh on the economic front to, to, to move uh, things in that direction? What's your opinion? Well, that's a good question. What will it take to get Spain to sit down and talk, which is the demand of most people? And I don't know. You know, Spain is very, very stubborn about Catalonia. One, because it doesn't want to lose 20% of its GDP. Um, and two, because of pride. There's definitely an emotional element involved. Spain cannot stand the idea that Catalans don't want to be part of Spain anymore. Really, it's, it's hurtful. I understand that. It's a little bit like a divorce in that sense, but that's not, that's not reason to impel them to stay. Will the non-violence ethos be held to in the circumstances we have now? Sure. I think so. Yeah. Anybody who took, play, took part in that October 1st referendum knows the strength of that strategy and the strength also of the Catalan people working together to make that happen. You know, that's what we will do again. We will join together to insist that we have a right to be heard. We have a right to, to speak, to choose our own future. And that future for you, Liz, is it 
in Catalonia, back to America? What's, what's the future for yourself? Right now it's in Catalonia, absolutely. I live in uh, the middle of Barcelona uh, with my three children, and um, I love it here. I am, you know, people call me Catalan, which I think is a great compliment. I feel very much at home here. I feel a part of this community. That's, a, that's you know, a wonderful thing for anyone. Perhaps a Lafayette of the Catalan Revolution. <laughs> That is quite a compliment. <laughs> Thank you. Well, to toast, uh, I, do, I do my part. To toast the future, uh, can I present you with the uh, Alex Salmon Quake? Uh, the, the, the Quake's a loving cup in Scots Gaelic. You whiskey, only Scotch, none of that bourbon. No, no, rubbish. no, I wouldn't dream of American whiskey. the Quake whiskey. and pass it round your Catalan friends. Thank you very much. Wow, that's a treat. I love whiskey. <laughs> in the weeks following the Spanish election, there is still no sign of a breakthrough in the standoff between Catalonia and the Madrid government. With the Catalan independence parties gaining ground and the extreme right wing making political progress in the rest of Spain, Socialist Prime Minister Sanchez may feel that he has little room to manoeuvre in changing tack from his hard line towards both Catalan ambitions and with regards to the political prisoners. However, this week came the news that the largest independence party, the ERC, are suggesting that they might be open to supporting a Sanchez government in the Cortes if the Prime Minister is open to discussions on independence. We will watch developments with interest. Certainly, there seems to be few more attractive options to real dialogue. It is difficult to see how continuing use of the Spanish judicial system is going to quieten rather further inflame independent sentiment. And it is difficult to prosecute the feelings of a people with any hope of success. Meanwhile, the independence movement has its own strategic issues to grasp. Can the various independence parties continue to present a united front and avoid major splits on strategy? And above all, can the cause hold on to its prized international reputation as a non-violent movement in the face of heightened political atmosphere of nine martyrs to the cause languishing in jail? In this regard, if indeed the Spanish authorities really have in mind a social media clampdown of the kind only previously deployed in Turkey and China, it seems unlikely to break the Catalan spirit. However, it would subject Spain to further international reputational damage. We'll report on any developments in next week's programme. Join us next time when Alex interviews some of the people rallying to the Catalan cause. We take the temperature on the streets as Catalonia debates its strategy for nationhood. But until then, from me, Alex and all of the show, it's goodbye for now and we hope to see you all next week.